Good evening. I am Finn J.D. John, reader at the Von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds. Tonight, I'm reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars. It is the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 17 Chained in Warhoon it must have been several hours before I regained consciousness, and I will remember the feeling of surprise which swept over me as I realized I was not dead. I was lying among a pile of sleeping silks and furs in the corner of a small room, in which there were several green warriors, and bending over me was an ancient and ugly female. As I opened my eyes, she turned to one of the warriors, saying, He will live, O Jed. Tis well, replied the one so addressed rising and approaching my couch. He should render rare sport for the great games. And now as my eye fell upon him, I saw that he was no Thark, for his ornaments and metal were not that of the Horde. He was a huge fellow, terribly scarred about the face and chest, with one broken tusk and a missing ear. Strapped on either breast were human skulls, and depending from these, a number of dried human hands. His reference to the great games, of which I had heard so much while well among the Tharks, convinced me that I had but jumped from purgatory into Gehanna. After a few more words with the female, during which she assured him that I was now fully fit to travel, the Jed ordered that we mount and ride after the main column. I was strapped securely to as wild and unmanageable a thoat as I have ever seen, and with a mounted warrior on either side to prevent the beast from bolting, we rode forth at a furious pace in pursuit of the column. My wounds gave me but little pain, so wonderfully and rapidly had the applications and injections of the female exercised their therapeutic powers, and so deftly had she bound and plastered the injuries. Just before dark, we reached the main body of troops, shortly after they had made camp for the night. I was immediately taken before their leader, who proved to be the Jeddak of the hordes of Warhoon. Like the Jed who brought me, he was frightfully scarred and also decorated with the breastplate of human skulls and dried dead hands, which seemed to mark all the greater warriors among the Warhoons, as well as to indicate their awful ferocity, which greatly transcends even that of the Tharks. The Jeddak, Bar Comus, who was relatively young, was the object of the fierce and jealous hatred of his old lieutenant, Doc Kova, the Jed who had captured me, and I could not but note the almost studied efforts which the latter made to affront his superior. He entirely omitted the usual formal salutation as we entered the presence of the Jeddak. As he pushed me roughly before the ruler, he exclaimed in a loud and menacing voice, I have brought a strange creature wearing the medal of a Thark, whom it is my pleasure to have battle with a wild thoat at the great games. He will die as Bar Comas, your Jeddak, sees fit, if at all, replied the young ruler, with emphasis and dignity. If at all, roared Doc Kova, by the dead hands at my throat he shall die, Bar Comas. No maudlin weakness on your part shall save him. Oh, would that Warhoon were ruled by a real Jeddak rather than a water-hearted weakling from whom even old Doc Kova could tear the metal with his bare hands. Barkomas eyed the defiant and insubordinate chieftain for an instant, his expression one of haughty, fearless contempt and hate, and then, without drawing a weapon and without uttering a word, he hurled himself at the throat of his defamer. I never before had seen two green Martians battle with nature's weapons and the exhibition of animal ferocity which ensued was as fearful a thing as the most disordered imagination could picture. They tore at each other's eyes and ears with their hands and with their gleaming tusks repeatedly slashed and gored until both were fairly cut to ribbons from head to foot. Bar Comas had much the better of the battle, as he was stronger, quicker, and more intelligent. It soon seemed that the encounter was done saving only the final death thrust when Bar Comas slipped and breaking away from a clinch. It was the one little opening that Doc Kova needed, and hurling himself at the body of his adversary, he buried his single mighty tusk in Bar Comus's groin, and with a last powerful effort ripped the young Jeddak wide open the full length of his body, the great tusk finally wedging in the bones of Bar Comus's jaw. Victor and vanquished rolled limp and lifeless upon the moss, a huge mass of torn and bloody flesh. Bar Comus was stone dead.
and only the most Herculean efforts on the part of Doc Kovas' female saved him from the fate he deserved. Three days later, he walked without assistance to the body of Bar Comas, which by custom had not been moved from where it fell, and placing his foot upon the neck of his erstwhile ruler, he assumed the title of Jeddak of Warhoon. The dead Jeddak's hands and head were removed to be added to the ornaments of his conqueror, and then his women cremated what remained among wild and terrible laughter. The injuries to Doc Kova had delayed the march so greatly that it was decided to give up on the expedition, which was a raid upon a small Thark community in retaliation for the destruction of the Incubator until after the Great Games, and the entire body of warriors, 10,000 in number, turned back toward Warhoon. My introduction to these cruel and bloodthirsty people was but an index to the scenes I witnessed almost daily while with them. They are a smaller horde than the Tharks, but much more ferocious. Not a day passed but that some members of the various Warhoon communities met in deadly combat. I have seen as high as eight mortal duels within a single day. We reached the city of Warhoon after some three days' march, and I was immediately cast into a dungeon and heavily chained to the floor and walls. Food was brought me at intervals, but owing to the utter darkness of the place, I do not know whether I lay there for days or weeks or months. It was the most horrible experience of all my life, and that my mind did not give way to the terrors of that inky blackness has been a wonder to me ever since. The place was filled with creeping, crawling things. Cold, sinuous bodies passed over me when I lay down, and in the darkness I occasionally caught glimpses of gleaming, fiery eyes fixed in horrible intentness upon me. No sound reached me from the world above, and no word would my jailer vouchsafe when my food was brought to me, although I at first bombarded him with questions. Finally, all the hatred and maniacal loathing for these awful creatures who had placed me in this horrible place was centered by my tottering reason upon this single emissary who represented to me the entire horde of warhoons. I had noticed that he always advanced with his dim torch to where he could place the food within my reach, and as he stooped to place it upon the floor, his head was about on a level with my breast. So with the cunning of a madman, I backed into the far corner of my cell when next I heard him approaching, and gathering a little slack of the great chain which held me in my hand, I waited his coming, crouching like some beast of prey. As he stooped to place my food on the ground, I swung the chain above my head and crashed the links with all my strength upon his skull. Without a sound, he slipped to the floor, stone dead. Laughing and chattering like the idiot I was fast becoming, I fell upon his prostrate form, my fingers feeling for his dead throat. Presently, they came in contact with a small chain at the end of which dangled a number of keys. The touch of my fingers on these keys brought back my reason and the suddenness of thought. No longer was I a gibbering idiot, but a sane, reasoning man with the means of escape in his very hands. As I was groping to remove the chain from about my victim's neck, I glanced up into the darkness to see six pairs of gleaming eyes that fixed unwinking upon me. Slowly they approached, and slowly I shrank back from the awful horror of them. Back into my corner I crouched, holding my hands, palms out before me, and stealthily on came the awful eyes until they reached the dead body at my feet. Then, slowly they retreated, but this time with a strange grating sound, and finally they disappeared in some black and distant recess of my dungeon. That's the end of today's reading. We'll continue tomorrow with the next chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Text, copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This reading copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John. More information about this project is at fawn-junst.org. Good night, and I wish you interesting...